Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It's September 29th, 2023. Just moments left inside of the trading week with the S&Ps. Well, some volatility coming out of this marketplace into this Friday afternoon close. It's the end of the quarter and well, markets just unhinged. It's bonds, dollar and what I term the tech catastrophe. Let me explain that and much more here, of course, on this Theo Trade weekend update. Right to work. Look, I don't have to explain a huge amount about some of the price action that we've seen in markets. I, you know, I'm not sure that the term volatility is being taken the right way because immediately people talk about volatility and they look at VIX and they go, well, the VIX is not that high. And we're going to actually discuss exactly that here on this weekend's update because there's some issues with overall implied volatility in the marketplace. However, as you look at intraday trade, Oh, this is, it really is Mr. Toad's kind of wild ride. Just a moment ago, you're trading up here at 43.41. A few minutes later, you're trading here at 43.20. Uh, you know, what's the difference? Three minutes, 11 or 12 S&P handles. It is a rather wild session from an intraday perspective, but it has been throughout the course of the week. We're seeing 10, 15, even 20 point moves inside of the S&P futures in minutes. And uh, it's not healthy. And I'm gonna explain exactly some of the issues in play, of course, for this next week of trade. Look, the recap of this, this past week, you know, what can you say? Look, there's a lot of volatility, but the SPX, as I said, for the most part, is uh, is unchanged. And again, I don't want to make uh, a big deal of the fact that we just sold off in the last you know couple of seconds here. But uh, overall, the uh, the week started, and again, right here, which is 43.20 inside of the S and P's. Look, we're just again mildly, mildly lower. Meanwhile, if you bring up the uh, the QQQ and bring up the QQQ for a second, because this is one of the big issues in play right now, the Qs are actually going to end the week uh, completely unchanged. And uh, that is, again, a bit of a tell. And I am going to speak directly to what I term the tech catastrophe. Even though the uh, NASDAQ is relatively unchanged, that is where some of the big risk kind of lurks inside of this marketplace. But let's, um, let's get right down to it because it's a fairly tumultuous week inside of the markets. You know, clearly we saw big sellers hit the overall indices, okay, coming into midweek. We bounced, we're fading off of it. Any bounce in here was meager to say the least. You know, this was a little bit of short covering. That's all I can really chalk it up to on both uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And I'm basing the idea of short covering. Like, look, the volume out here is not exactly surging, right? There's just there's not capitulation in the air. Like you're not fearing fear and loathing in this marketplace. You're not even close to that, which is again, one of the points that I want to make as we uh, kind of continue along this weekend's update here. So again, not a lot of like wild action. Moreover, <clears throat> I look at the Option Clearing Corp, which is known in the OCC. And I look at the volume at the end of the trading sessions. The volume was like, lackluster at best. It was average. Most days was actually below average option volume. The S&P volume isn't exactly rocking it. To be, uh, to be quite honest, and there, there is the closing bell, but to be quite honest with you, I am a little surprised. This is not summer trade. You're in the end of September. You're coming in okay, to the final quarter of the year. You're coming into October. This is volatility language here. And, uh, Again, the market just, it's not feeling it. As I said, the volume really makes a difference to me. But before we go any further about indices or about tech, let's get down to really, okay, the big issue in play. And that happens to be the bond market. Now, the bond market, well, this one actually does speak volumes about volume, soaring, soaring volume inside of the ZB. Okay, why I bring that up could be actually a sign of uh, capitulation 
early on in this marketplace. Moreover, if you take a look at the TLT, and you can look at the TLT with me, and yes, there's soaring volume in here, but I'm not concerned about that right now. Under TLT, I'm going to go to studies. I'm going to go to ad study. I'm going to go to volatility studies. Pull up implied volatility, and I want you to see implied volatility. It did, in fact, spike throughout the course of this week. Now, implied volatility right? Forward look at uh, at risk, if you will, but it took off. It's not at some of the absolute highs, okay, that we've seen, you know, as of late. But definitely implied volatility spikes. Uh, again, volume spikes in here uh, could be at, uh, at the least some short-term capitulation. But the first thing that I wanted to cover here on this weekend's update is <clears throat> it's everything about bonds. I mean, the bond market is in a full, complete upheaval uh, this is, uh, you don't want to call it a crash, you call it anything you want. It's a horrendous move inside of the bond market. And what I say about this, just please forget about interest rates. You know, I, I heard uh, a lot of CEOs coming out and talking, well, interest rates could go to here. Uh, they can go well over 5%. Okay. Like newsflash, those rates have already rocked. But at this point in time, and I'm serious about this, you forget about rates. Okay. When you start looking at the 10-year, why do I say forget about rates? Who cares at this point? You can go parabolic. You can have 6% on the 10-year. It doesn't make a difference because I'm going to tell you what it's really about. It's about panic at the disco. This is now a trade. This is, wow, we are selling off. It is just horrendous out there. And uh, maybe maybe we saw some, some lows in here, but uh, today... Uh, it didn't actually, it didn't make me feel all kinds of warm and fuzzy because if you looked at today's trade, we were rallying, the bonds were up over a full point and faded back. And that is not a good sign. That is not like money's not rushing in to be like, yeah, I got to buy this bonds. And the reason that I say forget about rates and I can't reiterate this enough. Now it's about traders. Now it's about margin calls. Now it's about panic. This is a trade and it's about a trade. Okay. And it's not about rates because I got to be frank again, no one gives a crap about 5% when they're panicking about their account. And you better remember that in the days to come because a lot of people are trying to bottom fish in interest rates, including me. They're trying to bottom fish. And look, I've been selling puts inside of the bond product. I have no problem saying that. I have been selling puts. I even covered a couple for, uh, for big profits this week. But I'm selling puts but I'm also going to tell you, I'm willing to get put bonds at 106. I'm willing to get put bonds at 105. Okay. I'm willing to get put bonds. I'm all the way out here. Okay. You know, 84 day expiration. I'm willing to get put bonds at 104. Bring it, bring the pain. Okay. If you're not willing to get put the bonds at those levels, if I were you, I would uh, possibly, uh, you know, use defined risk spreads or just move away from this bond market. Again, it's not about interest rates. It's about a panic, okay, inside of a marketplace and real sell side activity at this point. All right. So forget about rates, forget about any discussion of rates. No one cares when they're panicking and having to sell. That again is horrendous. And you're now looking at it uh, again. If you pull up a three year in here, look at a three year chart, but it's also critically important to come in here, go to futures, go to contract adjust. Okay. And it's even a steeper decline. Okay. There's just nothing to compare to the sell side activity that we've seen as of late inside of the uh, the U.S. Treasury markets, the uh, specifically the ZB, the 30-year um, bond treasury futures. They're getting decimated out there. The one saving grace is that volume really did spike. Volatility started to take off to the upside, and that could be some short-term capitulation at this point in time. Now, push that aside for a second. Obviously, that's an ugly area. If the bonds really start to panic, Evidently, it's probably going to kill tech, but I'm also big concerned about the U.S. dollar, okay, the dollar strength. Now, any way you want to shape this up, and, and again, we're looking right now at just a nine-month chart, and this is the dollar sign DYX. A lot of different ways to look at dollar. You can look at the dollar. You can look at the dollar versus euro. That's horrendous over here, but overall, inside of the dollar, again, I'm bothered by today's price action because we started significantly lower in the dollar. We rallied right back up. The dollar is finishing the day pretty much unchanged. Okay. And it has not broken really that, uh, just horrendous. You want to talk about a trend? Look, I'm not a market technician, but you can't even draw a line that straight on your screen to the upside. So absolutely parabolic. And the reason I bring up the dollar, okay, the dollar is, is really twofold. Number one, it's inflationary. Okay. A strong dollar exports inflation. So it's exporting inflation, which of course is going to bring, okay, 
it's of course going to bring significant issues around when it comes to inflation. In addition to it, why is it such a strong dollar? It's being used as a hedge. Look, I don't care any way that you want to shape the dollar, okay? It's not good. It's not good for inflation, and it's being used as a hedge. A hedge for what? Well, a hedge for the fact that other economies could be imploding. Oh, that could be. You know, people don't think of it that way. They're thinking of it as a, as a hedge for the what? Okay, as a hedge for the S&Ps? Sure, okay, you, you go for it. Could be a hedge for the fact that the, uh, the yen is absolutely collapsing. Okay, that's a possibility over here. Could be a hedge that uh, things like Bitcoin, you know, you haven't thought about this in a while, haven't talked about this in a while, but Bitcoin, finance might be uh, going to bite the bullet over there. We'll see. Okay, more on that. But it's a hedge. It could also be a hedge for, well, a lot of people don't necessarily want to invest right now inside of S&Ps. Evidently, they don't want to invest in bonds right now. Okay, any way you want to shape this, right? The buying of the dollar is not good for equity markets. I don't think it's good for a global economy. It is not a positive sign in the marketplace. So obviously you've got, uh, you know, interest rates soaring. Forget about rates. It's about bonds crashing at this point. You get dollar strength. Next, we got to talk about what I term the tech catastrophe. Okay. And the reason I keep calling it this, and I've, I've just been hammering throughout the course of the week, and I talked about this a bit on Wednesday night's video, and I'm really going to go after it right now. I don't like what I see in tech. I don't have to like it. I don't want to like it. Okay. I don't even like it a little bit. Why am I going after tech? Because what I call the tech catastrophe, the selling hasn't even begun. Right. And this actually ties into the next bullet as well as there's a lack of volatility because there's a lack of correlation. The point that I want to make with this is look, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and preach to you about being bullish or bearish inside of the S&Ps because quite frankly, look, I am not a market technician, okay? What I do do though, is I will actually be very quantitative and say like, hey, there's a reason that the bonds are selling off right now. You know, again, a little bit of panic in the marketplace. There's a reason that people are moving towards the dollar. It's just not a lot of crap in the world you want to buy. And in the end, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, money, all right, and fiat currency, eh, I guess the US dollar beats anything else out there. I keep hearing people like, you can't buy the dollar. Of course you can, you know? Okay. At the same time, you're like, I really want to buy gold. That doesn't look good. It could actually be, though, one of the greatest times to buy gold okay, in recent history. Think about that for a second. If the dollar were to turn around, gold explodes to the upside. Inflationary pressures come back. Dogs and cats living together. But tech, tech really bothers me more than any other product on the screen right now. And I want to make sure that I'm very clear about this. As I said a moment ago, I'm not going to preach to you whether we're going up or down. Who cares? Like when I say who cares, like sure, everybody's going to be out there, but but the S&Ps are this, what are they, all right? The S&Ps right now are now only up 12%. They're barely outperforming, okay, in an average year. Meanwhile, the NASDAQ, let's bring up the NASDAQ for a second. This should scare you a little bit. The NASDAQ's still up 35% in year-to-date basis. Good, got it. So what's my problem with the S&Ps? My problem with the S&Ps is, you know what brought the S&Ps up 12%? Do you? Okay. Clearly, it's not the financials. The financials are now down 3% in the year. Evidently, it's uh, it's definitely not the energy sector. The energy sector is up 7% in the year, but I just showed you that the S&Ps are up 12%. The NASDAQ's up 35%. Look, in the end, what brought the S&Ps higher? It's tech. Okay. Here's actually what we term the monsters of tech. It's up uh, 59% on the year. The monsters of tech is a conglomerate symbol of Meta and Apple and Microsoft and Google and Amazon. Oh my, doesn't even include Tesla and NVIDIA. Okay. And uh, NVIDIA is up uh, 200%. So why am I bothered right now by markets? Okay. And why do I call this a tech catastrophe? Mega market cap has yet to even really sell. And there's nothing. Forget about percentage returns. I'm serious. Let's look at the chart. That hasn't sold off at all. In fact, if you want to bring up NVIDIA, it actually broke the upper edge of the expected move. Yeah, you didn't see that one coming, did you? Uh, if you look at uh, Tesla this week, it's actually up in the week. You want to talk about uh, Meta? Okay. Meta today actually hit the upper edge of the expected move, reverted back down. It's going to end up flat on the week, but that's okay. Google, what do you got for Google? Same thing. Google hit the upper edge, actually reverted back down. It's about Amazon. Okay. Amazon actually recovered significantly on the week. And I just, I love to go through this. Okay. All right. You got me. Apple. Okay. And Microsoft took a bit of a hit. The irony is that Microsoft will end the week massively unchanged. The reason I keep, you know, yapping about like they haven't even begun to sell off over here. There's one key component missing from big tech right now. There's a lack of correlation. 
serious lack of correlation. Okay. If you're sitting there and you're actually, you know, preaching to me that, oh, but Don, the S and P's are in oversold territory. I wouldn't disagree with that. Look, I can look at every technical just like you can, right? Oh, look at that. Okay. This is oversold turf. And what am I looking at? It's a Theo trade RSI Laguerre. It's a Laguerre polynomial. Okay. But it's like an RSI, right? In its fractal energy, the fractal energies run out, yada, yada, yada. It's in totally oversold conditions. I got it. Okay. And at the same time, I'm telling you, I just don't care because one of the things that's missing is if markets are going to capitulate, you got to see higher degrees of correlation. Right. And I'm not just talking about here's cool, like when S&P 100. Well, there's 35 stocks uh, higher, 67 lower. No, you got to see higher degrees of correlation expressly inside of technology. Why? Tech is what brought the markets higher. And you can say whatever you want about Microsoft. Microsoft is still up 30, almost 2% on the year. And Apple, you say what you want about Apple and it's still up almost 37% in the year. And then NVIDIA is up 200% in the year. And then you realize, holy crap, I see what he's talking about. There's been no burst in volume here. There's been no burst of volatility over here. There has been nothing. There's bifurcations inside of tech. And you cannot tell me that the S&Ps have seen any degree of capitulation until tech gets whacked across the board. All right. You have to have selling and the kind of selling that just there's no discrimination. We just hit them across the board. We don't look back. Nobody's puking out their guts over here. It has not even begun. And that's the point I want to make. There's a lack of volatility. Now we can bring up the VIX. You know, the VIX, the VIX started to move to the upside. Yeah, the S&Ps though came off from what? Let's call it 45.50, a precipitous drop Okay, 250 points lower. It's even a little bit more than that, but just rounded 250 point drop. What did the VIX do? It yawned. Okay, uh, I'll get up when I need to. Like absolutely nothing is going on in terms of volatility. Like we're not vol rocking out there. Okay, and that scares me. Lack of volatility in this marketplace. So what? Right now, all we're doing is just kind of slipping into a warm bath of red in this marketplace. So. Keep it in mind because, uh, you know, look, at this point, I would agree we're a little bit oversold conditions. Should we rally back up? Sure. Let's get crazy. Let's rally. But the point that I really want to drive home to each and every one of you, in every marketplace, I think that there's upside potential and there's downside risk. And at this point in time, I think the downside risk is phenomenally great versus upside potential. That's all I want to resonate with you. Is there upside potential? Unequivocally. Markets could easily rally in days back to 4,500, possibly creating one of the greatest short opportunities, but neither here nor there. Markets rallying up is going to be limited. The uh, the downside over here, there's nothing staring you down but uh, this and the abyss. Now, everybody's going to talk about it's the, you know, the whole trading community, okay? Federal government looks like they're going to shut down. The biggest thing that's going to be imparted upon us as traders, there's no government data. And I do want to bring this up for a second because week in and week out, I keep talking about all the data that's coming out. I think from CPI to PCE, okay, to PMI reports to, for instance, this Friday, you're supposed to have an employment situation. Clear the board, people. You ain't getting nothing, which is you better switch gears because now ADP, the ADP, right? That's a private report. That is not federal, okay? You're not going to get anything out of the marketplace other than private data. All right, government shutdown implies no petroleum status report. Why? Because that's the Energy Information Administration. Um, you will get some Fed speak. Jerome Powell will come out and speak because, well, Fed speakers are, <laughs> they're paid to come out and speak. They're not going to stop. Uh, they are paid individually to come out and speak and not on behalf of the Fed, but uh, they get paid at their own little bank account. Lovely. Nevertheless, they're going to be a lack of data. And the reason I'm really talking about this and I want to impart it upon you is that a government shutdown has not necessarily been bearish for markets. But in a marketplace that is absolutely data hungry, every week I talk about how the marketplace is like a chocolate covered hand grenade okay and how that every one of these announcements is like a fuse well now you're sitting basically on a powder keg and it doesn't have a fuse you don't know when it's going to go off now you got to be careful because the kind of volatility that we could see could actually spark all right windfalls of gamma risk all the zero dte options 
it could get real out there and it could get real in a hurry. You know, you think I'm going to talk about, well, there's no government data. There's no, you know, genesis to, to, to trade off. of. Forget about that, right? The trades are going to be coming. But on an intraday basis, okay, the slightest hint of data coming out, even European data, could really rock the marketplace because there's not a big driver at this point of the gamma risk. And again, I'll explain that much more here when we hit this marketplace throughout the course of the week that you're going to feel it is going to be literally like driverless. But at the same time, then it's all going to be gamma risk, it's all going to be hedging activity. And if that ball starts to roll downhill, it's going to get crazy and crazy in a hurry. All right, let's cruise down to the SPX, the mother of all products. So inside of the SPX, okay, in this past week of trade, the week that literally just ended moments ago, we had basically an $84 expected move. Tag! Okay. In fact, you know, there was a, there was an argument going on here in the uh, Theo Trade chat room and people were talking about, did it hit the edge of the expected move? Look, okay, right here. Okay. What is, what is here? That's ah, on Wednesday. It came within two points of the uh, lower edge of the expected move. It's a tag. Look, expected move is nothing more than an average. We hit the lower edge of the expected move. We ripped off of it. Okay. Now, like I said, I'm not here to try to, you know, assign directional bias. Again, everybody agrees, including me. We're in oversold conditions. Oversold conditions, though, markets never tank from all time highs. Markets tank from oversold conditions. And that's why I'm not here to try to assign, you know, a bullish or bearish stance to this. Look, okay, I have bearish positions on people. I'm negative delta. Like, you know, I wear my positions like a badge of honor. Like, do I want us to go down? Absolutely. And volatility to explode. But I'm also the first to tell you, this is how markets get coiled up, short covering sparks, this rip your face off rallies, which you need to worry about more than directional bias, okay, is really what, uh, what price action the market holds. And the price action is all in the expected move. Now, this is interesting. And I'm going to tell you why it's so interesting. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Government shutdown, yada, yada, yada. The first week of October, why do we have an $80 expected move? So we just came off of a heavy expected move of 84 bucks, okay? We don't have a lot of announcements ahead of us. Maybe it is the government shutdown. I don't know, okay? The employment situation over there, no, there's no divergence for employment situation because it doesn't look like the employment situation is even gonna happen, okay? Government shutdown, what do you got? You have a heavy expected move on a week that I wouldn't have expected it. This you better pay attention to because an $80 expected move like we had last week is put on your big boy pants. We are going to be a rockin' throughout the course of this week. So again, put your volatility helmets on and do not take them off. Remember what I'm saying about tech. Like I, Again, I don't mean to, to scare anybody. This is not meant to freak anybody out, but I'm calling it you know, hey, look, selling hasn't even really begun inside of tech. You'll know it when you see correlation hit, when you see, you know, literally tech getting hit across the board. There's no discrimination in sell side activity. There's nothing but what? Every man, woman, and child for themselves. And we just nowhere near that. And that's the one thing I really want to resonate with people of why I don't like the present risk reward of this marketplace. All right, last up over here, a reminder to each and every one of you, look, Theo Trade, okay, our live event for 2023, A Trader's Paradise, being held in Delray Beach in Florida. This is it, people. This is your last opportunity to sign up. Go to theotrade.com forward slash 23. I say it's the last opportunity. We okay, are shutting down the room block okay, for the live event. And this live event is just that. It is happening down in Florida. Okay, Obviously, I'm going to scroll back up here, go through the dates. Thursday, November 2nd, it's actually going to kick off with a cocktail party. So you can fly in on Thursday, November 2nd. Friday, November 3rd, full day of education. Uh, Saturday, November 4th. By the way, we're going to have presentations from everybody from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, obviously Tasty Trade. Uh, I've heard, okay, I've heard rumors that I will be speaking with none other than uh, Tom Sosnoff. That should be fun. We haven't done something together in almost, 
oh, it's like seven or eight years since I've actually done a session with Tom. So I'm going to get excited about that because, uh, you know, Salznoff is my, uh, he's my previous work wife. He's my ex work wife, uh, is uh, Salznoff, 10 years of traveling with him. It's, uh, it's amazing I've remained so fit over the years. <laughs> anyway, with that, what you need to do, step one, buy your ticket. If you don't already have a ticket to the event, buy the ticket. Again, theotrade.com forward slash 23. Step two, book your room. As I said, this is it. October 3rd, that's the last chance to actually book the room at the hotel. Again, I will leave this up here. Look, there's a lot to think about in this next week of trade. Join us all throughout the course of this next week here live at Theo Trade. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.